Why don't you guys give it up for Bob Taylor? Amen. You know, I've been walking with the Lord for, I mean, truly walking with him, say, for, say, 38 years. And in those 38 years, I've never heard anybody preach a whole sermon about the devil, about our enemy. You know, every, every pastor, every teacher, they'll insert sections and pieces about him, but, and they should. But I started studying on this, and you know, the Bible has a lot to say about our enemy. It has a lot to say about the devil. You know, and uh, for a long time, when I first came into the things, started, got born again, started walking with God, you know, people would talk about the devil, you know, and you think in your mind, well, where did he come from? How did he get here? You know, when all the time, it, it was in the scriptures, but, you know, if you're ignorant, you don't know it. So to, unless, until somebody told me, somebody showed me, I didn't realize the Bible has a lot to say about him before he came to earth. You know, Ezekiel 28, that we don't have it on the board, but Ezekiel 28, verses, of, you know, 12 through 17, has, it talks about him. And I'm just going to give, a, for time's sake, I'm just going to give a little synopsis of what it has to say. It says, Satan was created by God in all wisdom and had access to God's garden, Eden. And every precious stone was his covering. And it goes through and lists all the diamonds and pearls and onyx and all these different stones that are part, was part of his covering. But it also says he was gifted in music. You know, the old you know, Bible scholars say that he, was, he led praise and worship in heaven. You know, and, and, it says, it, the, and Ezekiel talks about the fact that music was built into him. So, you know, he had to have some glorious music coming out of him for him to be the praise and worship leader in heaven. You know, for that to happen, like I say, he, he says he was the anointed cherub and he led praise and worship in a congregation of heaven. See, he was perfect in all his ways, it said, and he, as, until sin was found in him. Iniquity was found in him. You know, and you say, well, what, what was that iniquity? Well, you know what? Let's look at Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 17, and it'll tell us. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. But thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that, that opened not the house of his prisoners. But did you see that in the verse before that? It talked about he, he, he narrowed that he destroyed the earth. He came and made the earth to tremble. He did shake kingdoms, and he, you know, and he made the earth as a wilderness. You know, it sounds a lot like Genesis 1-1 to me. You know, so you kind of wonder, you know, is that what happened when he was cast out of heaven if that wasn't so catastrophic that it destroyed the world as it was. Makes you wonder. You know, I'm not saying that's what happened, but it makes you wonder. You know, you notice in, uh, in Isaiah there, it's five times he, was, he, he said, I will. See, he was full of himself. I mean, you know, full of pride and arrogance. You know, he was, and he said, you know, he said, you can always, you know, you can always locate a spirit of pride. You can always locate it because it's always I, I, I. Look at me. See, and he, here he was. I mean, he had a beautiful position, a wonderful position. Here he was, you know, an angel of God. And all he had to do was worship God and present praise and worship in heaven. But he got to thinking, hey, look at I got all these stones, you know, and I'm, I'm full of wisdom. Man, look at me. You know, I know what. I can exalt myself above the stars. I can exalt myself up above the God. You know, he, he saw, he looked at it like this. He got, let arrogance get in his heart. He said iniquity was found in his heart. So see, he, in uh, Proverbs 16 talks about, it says, a haughty spirit goes before a fall. And a proud spirit, he talks about a proud spirit there, goes before destruction. See, and he had a proud spirit and he was, and he was cast to earth. See, if we, that's why we cannot allow ourselves to get prideful. You may get a position, you may have a position at work, or a position somewhere in the church or whatever. But you know we can't allow that to make to puff you up. To make you think I'm something. 
See, we can, if, if nothing else, you can look back and see what happened to the devil. You know, when he got to thinking, hey, I'm, I'm something. I'm, look at me. I'm impressive. You know what? Without Jesus, we're nothing. Yeah. We're certainly not impressive. You know, Luke 10, 19, 8, 10, Luke 10, 18 and 19, it talks about the fact that, uh, you know, it says Jesus, and it was t- Jesus is talking. He said, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So, see, Jesus was there when Satan was cast out of heaven. So he knew what he was talking about. He said, I saw it. You know, Jesus saw him like lightning. Now, but we, and he said, but now I give you power and authority over the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. See, so what is he saying? He's saying, hey, you know, maybe he was cast down, but he's nothing compared to the power and authority that I have and I'm giving you. See, we have power and authority over the enemy. You know, you may say, well, you know, you know, I've had people say, you know, you don't want to preach against the devil. Man, he might do something to you. Let him come on. See, because the thing of it is, if we know who we are in Christ, he is nothing to us. The Bible says he's under our feet. You know, so, so we have nothing to worry about. See, the same pride and lust for power and control that Satan had, it's, it, you know, you can see it in the earth today. You know, you can see it. You, I hate to say it, but you can see it in the church. You know, sometimes, you know, you, a pastor or somebody gives, board member, they give a person a position, and the first thing you know, it goes through their head, and they think, hey, look at me, I'm something special. But you know what? It goes back to the thing where it's in him we live, move, and have our being. If, we, if we're not in him, we're nothing. That's the only thing that makes us something is the fact we're in him. You know, and if we forget that and get to looking at, look at me, then we're done. You know, we said, you know, pride comes before a fall. And it'll be, you know, be destructive. But see, we see this even in the body of Christ. Why? Because the body of Christ as a whole has not taken their rightful place or their God-given authority in this earth. See, if you know who you are in Christ, if you know that he's given you authority over the evil one, the enemy, the devil, then you don't worry about trying to be something or trying to look like something special. You just do what you're supposed to do. You walk in love, you know, and you share God, you share Jesus with everybody that'll listen, you know, and you do your job as unto the Lord. You just live a good Christian life as an example, and you'll do more good, and you don't have to brag on yourself. God will do it for you. The Bible says in uh, 1 Peter, it talks about if you humble yourself, he'll exalt you in due time, you know. The trouble is we, we get anxious. We want to get up there before we're ready, you know, and I've seen that happen, and I've seen people have a hard fall, too, and it's sad. Look at Romans 12, 3. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. See, normally I would teach on faith right there, but what we're, tonight, tonight we're looking at the fact of pride and the fact the enemy was full of pride. Well, we don't want to get to that place. See, he said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But think soberly. If you're thinking soberly, you're thinking, that means you're clear-minded. You know, you're thinking the way God wants you to think. You know, see, we can't have an exaggerated opinion of ourselves and expect God to bless us because he won't do it. You know, he can't bless arrogance and he can't bless ignorance. You know, sad but true, you know. For without him, we are nothing. You know, I saw, I read that, you know, I, I said that. Acts 17, 28, where he says, in him we live, move, and have our being. Look at Hosea 4, 6. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I have also rejected thee. That thou shouldest not be priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. But see, I want you to look at the first part of this. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We understand that knowledge is power. Okay? Satan knows that. So if he can keep you ignorant then you don't have the power you need to keep him under your feet. You don't have the power to deal with the situations, the things he brings your way. Instead, then he comes along and he batters you upside, you know, like, like the movie, blindside. You know, he comes up and blindsides you, and you're not aware of it, and you're not prepared for it, so it sets you back. And the first thing you do, instead of knowing that you've got an enemy and thinking about you, this, the enemy did this, you say, God, why did you let this happen to me? See, you start putting the blame back on God, when we know God is all good, the devil's all bad, but yet situation comes, what do you do? God, 
Why did you let this happen to me? Why me, God? You know, instead of putting it where it rightly belongs, say, hey, Lord, where did I open the door to give the enemy a place? And if that's not the case, then, the, then Satan, you have no right to do this to me, no right to my family or whatever, and you rebuke him in the name of Jesus, you move on. But see, you don't allow him to have a place. Because nowhere in the New Testament does it ever say that Satan had any position or any authority to rule over you in any way. If you're born again, he, Jesus said he's under your feet. You, if, so if he's under your feet, what are you giving him a position of authority over you for? It's a lot of times it's because of laziness, and I hate to say that for a Christian, for laziness or lack of knowledge. You know, Hebrews 10, 7 talks about, it says, Lo, I come in the volume of a book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. See, this is Jesus. Talk, they're talking about Jesus here. But see, this book is our instruction manual. This book is where we get the understanding, the knowledge of who we are in Christ and the knowledge of who he is. And we know that Jesus reduced him to zero. One translation of Colossians 2.15 says that he is reduced to zero. Another one says, you know, that he said he spoiled principalities and powers, making a show of them openly. So what did he do? He tied, you know, it's like the Romans did. They would try to tie the kings and the people of authority. When they, when they defeated a, a nation, they'd tie their kings and their royalty at, with a ropes and put them in like a chain, and they'd walk through, parade them through their city that they had defeated. They were back, take them back to Rome and parade them through downtown Rome. Well, see, Jesus did that in the heavenly realm. When he defeated Satan in hell, that he made a show of him openly. He paraded him through the, through the spirit world so everybody could see that he's defeated. You know, so if he's already defeated and he gave us that his authority, his power, he said, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. By no means nothing will bother you. Then guess what? Then if we're walking in that, it should not bother The Satan can't do anything to bother you. We keep our heart right. We walk in love. And, and, and the Bible says, you know, that we... When we do that, we don't give the devil no place. We give him no place. 2 Timothy 2.15, we should all know this one. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why do we need to do this? So that we know what the word of God says, what it says about our position, our authority, who we are in Christ, and what the devil is, and how, how he has no rights to come against you or defeat you, you know, what, what is it, Matthew 18, 18 says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. See, the devil comes against you, and you know your heart's right with God, and you know you're walking in love. You bind that thing. You Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, and you expect him to go. It's a faith thing. It's a spiritual thing. See, the thing with the devil, he can't reach you. He can't touch you and me unless we get into the mental realm or the fleshly realm. He can't touch us in the spirit. He has no spiritual power anymore. It, when he was kicked out of heaven, he lost that. He just has power and authority in this earth and in, in the, the normal, natural realm of this earth. And, then, and he only has that if we give it to him. Look at uh, John 8, 44. This, this is a good one here. See, but we're talking about the character. See, we, Pastor Bob, Pastor Candy, been talking about the character of God and, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And he's been talking about, you know, found, foundations. Well, this is a foundation. You need to know who your enemy is. I had a guy I worked with for years when I was a lead carpenter at Vanderbilt, and he, would, and he was always saying, Bob, you got to keep your, your friends close and your enemies closer. Well, see, that's not true. That's a lie because you want to keep them at a, the, your enemy at a distance, but at the same time, you're not ignorant of his devices. You know, you know, you know you got to know when he comes along, hey, you know, he can't touch me. Remember the song, don't touch this, you know, can't touch me. Okay, and, uh, see, but see, you know, like I said, he said, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. See, Satan's a liar, he's a murderer, he's a thief. You know, like I said, there's nothing good in him, and we need to understand that. James 1.22, you know, says, but be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. See, that's the trouble with a lot of Christians. And I'd like to think it's nobody in here. But at the same time, a lot of Christians, they hear the word. And the, hear the pastor, the preacher, whoever's speaking. They hear that word, and it sounds good and wonderful to them. But you know what? They don't, be, they don't become a doer of it. 
And if, you de- if you're not a doer, the Bible says you're de- deceiving yourself. And guess what? One of Satan's favorite things is to deceive people. So if you're not getting in the word in you, walking it out in your life, then you're in a position where he can de- come in and deceive you, and you don't even realize he's done it until you're in trouble, you know, until you're going through something and you don't know how to get out. You know, John 10, 10 talks about the fact that a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But see, we deceive ourselves when we think we don't have time to study by God's Word. We don't have time to, to get in the, in the Bible. I, you, know, you, you know, the thing of it is, you don't have time not to. In this world, the way it is today, we don't have time not to get in the Word of God. You say, you, I mean, you put something else aside. You do away with something else. But you put the Word of God in your life every day. You put personal prayer time and praise in your life every day. I mean, you get, I, I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I have to be at work at 6. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning just so, with everybody else in bed asleep, just so I can spend t- that time with God, worshiping Him, reading His Word, meditating on Him, and just praying in the Holy Ghost, talking to the Holy Spirit. You know, because you've got to do that, because I don't know what I'm going to face when I get out in that world, unless God shows me by the Spirit. Otherwise, but i got to be ready. And if you're, if you're full of the Word, full of prayer, full of praise, there's nothing the enemy can bring against you that you, you're not ready for. You know, uh, just like sports, you know, we're talking, you know, when, um, when I was in high school or school, high school, you know, if you, if you were in high school or college and you played sports, you know what I'm going to say. You know, when, uh, if you played, the, the coach would come in. I was too small. You know, I played a little second string, but I was never on the main, a real team because I was too small and I didn't weigh enough and I wasn't tall enough. But some of my friends played football. On, so every Friday morning, well, most of the time it's Monday, but every once in a while they do it on Friday, they would call the team in, and they'd sit down, and they'd start watching films. They'd watch films of the people they were going to play that Friday night, especially in high school. Going to play on Friday nights, the team they are going to play, and they studied those films. And especially, like say, if you was a tackle or whatever, tight end, whatever, you'd see what the other team did at certain points and so that you could prepare yourself. Well, see, that's the same way. You know, we need to prepare ourselves. You study him by what the Bible says about him, that way, when he comes against you, you know, like I say, you know, if, if somebody's trying to break a tackle, you know, you, you, know you, you stop him. And that's what we do with Satan, but we stop him with the words coming out of our mouth. We stop him with God's word coming out of our mouth. See, so, Satan is no, he's no different. He comes at us the same way. He studies us. I heard one guy say, he said, I think Satan, I think he has uh, group meetings. He has like a staff, staff meeting especially if you're doing something for God, he has staff meetings to discuss how we're going to defeat this guy, how we're going to stop him. You know what? And we should be as smart as he is. I mean, if, he, if he's got a strategy to stop you and me from fulfilling God's call in our life, then we should at least be smart enough to do the same thing. I mean, we should, we should study the Word of God so that we've got a strategy. When he comes, you know, and you know your heart's right and your heart's clear, like I said before, you bind him in the name of Jesus. No, you don't, devil. You're under my feet. Now get under there. You, you know, you talk. You've got to learn how to talk, how to say things out of your mouth. Because, you know, your victory, your failure or your victory is in your mouth. Whatever comes out of your mouth. But see, that's, you know, that's what we have to learn to do. Ephesians 4.27 says this. It says, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. The Amplified says, like, don't give the devil a foothold. And you know what? I, when I saw that, And if you look at the scriptures before it, it talks about you. If you stole, steal no more. If you lied, don't lie anymore. It tells you things to do so you won't get placed. But the Amplified says it like this. It says, uh, don't give the devil a foothold. You ever think about a foothold? When I I think about a foothold, I think of a a movie with a detective movie or something, you know, where you knock on the door, boom, 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 you knock on the door, and they open the door, and then before, and then they see you're a cop or whatever, they go to shut the door, you stick your foot in the door. Well, see, that's what Satan wants to do to us. He wants to get, his, get a foothold in our life. You know, and all, he, all it takes is for us to let our guard down. And, it's, you know, and you say, well, how do you do that? Get out of love with somebody. Start talking about somebody. Gossiping. You know, talking down on somebody. You know, instead of, you know, if they, come, if they say something that you don't agree with, say, Lord, I don't understand that. I'm not sure I agree with that. But, Lord, I'm not, not going to touch it. See, we've got to watch what we say out of our mouth. If it, George, some of you guys, and Gary, some of you guys in my class, we talk about this quite a bit. 
That's, it's what comes out of your mouth. Life and death in the power of the tongue. So you've got to watch what you're saying. Because the same tongue that will put you over will bring you below. It'll bring you low. But see, you know, I give you a challenge. Get in Ephesians chapter 4, read through 11 through 32. And it shows, it showed him, you know, it showed, like I was talking about, it showed places that for how you could give him place. Lying, it said, if you lie, don't lie no more. If you stole, don't steal no more. Things like that. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says it like this. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. If I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes I forgive it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. See, that's the part I wanted us to get to. See, the, Paul said, he said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, of the enemy's devices. Well, guess what? If you're not in this book, you're ignorant. See, that goes back to that thing I said before. You know, if you're, if you, if you're ignorant, then you don't know. The, you know. the opposite of ignorance is knowledge. See, so if you have the knowledge of what the Word of God says about your enemy and who you are in Christ, then, you know, then you're not ignorant. So then you, when Satan comes, you're not ignorant. It don't surprise you. You know, you don't have that blindsided thing where that tackle takes you out if the ball goes tumbling down the, down the field because you were aware he was coming. See, that's the same way with the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 says it like this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, it says he walks about as a roaring lion. But see, we, I just told you in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Colossians 2, 15, Satan, or Jesus defeated Satan, made a show of him openly. So see, he's defeated, so all he can do. David Engels had a song years ago. And it says, now that he, Jesus, he knocked his teeth out, and all he can do is say, meow. meow. Yeah. So see, see, Satan, he has no power, no authority, unless we give it to him. You know? That's why, you know, before we read, it said, give the devil no place. But see, he says, be sober and be vigilant. See, you want to be on your guard. I mean, you'd be foolish not to be on your guard, you know. And how do you be on your guard? You keep yourself in love. You check yourself. You check, am I walking in love, you know? Am I, am I being mean to people? Am I saying things, doing things that I shouldn't be doing as a man or a woman of God? See, you, you check yourself. You examine yourself. But see, you know, if, you, if we don't have it on the screen, but you look at uh, 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. See, a big part of being, you know, diligent and being on guard is keeping yourself humble. You know, we said something first about he was in pride. Satan was full of pride. Well, guess what? You can't be humble and in pride at the same time. So if we keep ourselves humbled under God, James says it like this. He said, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. So see, that's what we have to do. We keep ourselves humble before God and then we resist the devil. And like I say, if when he comes at it, all he can do to you is say meow. You know, all he can do, he's, he's just a, a roar. I heard one pastor, one minister say when he's talking about he seeketh whom he said he goes about as a roaring lion. He said, what he's doing, he said, he tries to get so many situations and circumstances coming at you at one time that it sounds like a big roar. When all the time, it's all a facade. It's all to get you confused, get you upset, so that he can take advantage of you. But see, we, the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. We know him and we know who he is. The devil's main tool to control us is manipulation. See, the devil, he loves to manipulate people. Because, see, that's he, all his, his dream, even when he was in, in heaven, was to be in charge, to rule, okay? So when he came down here and he deceived Eve and Adam bit into it, then he, he, got his, he got his wish. He became God of this world. But guess what? Along comes Jesus and he screws up his plan. Amen. He messes it up, you know? But, uh, but before we get to that, look at Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. See, it's not exactly what he said. But anyway, and the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knoweth 
that in the day that you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, look at that. See, he's lying. the devil's using, trying to take God's words, twist them, so that she, and, and she bit into it. She, she bought into the lie. You know, you'll be as gods. They already were gods. You know, they were gods of this earth. They already were gods. You know, and they, you know, all, all God expected of them just just leave his, you know, his tie tree. Leave that one alone. You know, and everything else, you could do anything you want to. I mean, you could eat anything you wanted. But see, you know, it's funny how that as soon as somebody, even as a kid, when mom said, you can't have that, what happened? That doggone flesh desire come out, I want that. I got, I'm going to get that somehow. So you got sneaky trying to figure out how you were going to get it, and it got you in trouble. Yep. See, he noticed Adam and Eve, it got them in trouble. When they, when they bit into the lie of the devil, and they bit into the fruit. But see, as Webster says, Webster's dictionary says, it says to operate manual, to manipulate is to operate manually or mechanically with skill, to manage skillfully or control, to change by artful or unfair means so as to achieve a desired end and an unfair advantage. See, that's what he's doing. That's what he wants to do. He wants to manipulate you and me to the point and used by unfair advantages. Because he knows, you know, he can't come, he's just like Jesus. He came at him just like he came at Eve. We see this in, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. We're going to read those, those. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God command that these stones be made bread and he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him up on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him if thou be the son of God cast thyself down for it is written he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time Thou dashed thy foot against a stone. But Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him. See, he's devil. He's persistent. He taketh him again, taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said unto him, Get thee behind me, or get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. See there? It said, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. But the thing I want you to see, see, the devil, the enemy, Satan, he used the same same plan, the same scheme on Jesus, and it, it worked with Eve. He thought, hey, if it worked with her, it'll work with him. But guess what? Jesus knew who he was. He knew he was the Son of God. You know, he knew that. He knew that, you know, there wasn't nothing they could, that he couldn't offer him anything. And, and he knew the word of God. See, he knew what his father's word said and everything the devil offered him, he knew was, was all, were already his. It's just a matter for Satan's lease to run out. But he knew it was his. That's where we are. Satan comes to you with a lie, said, oh, you know, if you'll just, if you worked at a bank, he said, hey, if you'll just take this little bit of money, nobody will ever know. You know, he lies to you. And then, then he turns right around, and then you get caught and go to prison. I had a buddy of mine when Sheila and I used to teach at a prison, a prison farm down in Nashville, and we'd go out there every Thursday night and teach the prisoners. Okay, well, uh, there was one guy in there. He was a Christian, spirit-filled, if you can believe it, but yet he hooked up with a couple other guys because his family was in, in need, and rather than go to church and ask for help, he, he hooked up these guys, and they robbed a bank. Well, guess what? He got 10 to 12 in prison, you know, so now his family, his, his wife and his two children, they're worse off than they were before. Because Sheila and I met them. They were worse off than they were before. They're pretty much living on, you know, handouts and, and government assistance while he's in prison, you know, working on a farm. So, you know, I mean, see, that was a, the devil took advantage of him. Took, and the, he used his ignorance to, to, to use, mess him up and put him in prison. See, 2 Corinthians, so look at this, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And we're going to change, manipulation begins in the mind. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
Okay. Yeah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of God, the obedience of Christ. But you notice in, in verse 3, it talks about, it says, you know, it says that we're, for we, bar, for we are, do not walk in the flesh or we don't war in the flesh. Well, guess what? See, we don't fight flesh. We don't fight people. You know, we don't, we don't war against flesh and blood. But we war against the spiritual wickedness, the evil one, the Satan, the devil. See, remember, people are not our enemy. The devil is. Satan is. And, but he will use people. And the sad thing about it is, you know, most of the time, even as Christians, unless God were to open up the, the spirit realm, let us see, you know, discern, have given us discerning of spirits like, you know, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about, verse 10 talks about, then we don't see that devil, that demon, that evil spirit that's, that's telling this person or, or enforcing this thing to cause the person to say things that hurt you or, or whatever, things to make you to, you know, put you down or hurt you or, or make you feel, you know, like, hey, you know, where did that come from? I thought that was my friend. See, when, they, when in reality, it wasn't the person so much. They yielded to the evil spirit. But it was that evil spirit that drove them, that controlled them at that moment. And the sad thing about it, if we look at ourselves, examine ourselves, we've all been used like that at some point or another to hurt somebody else. You know, when in reality, we didn't mean to. But the enemy, we allowed him to, to give us a thought or whatever. And we said something that hurt somebody. See, but we don't. So we don't war against flesh and blood. People are not our enemy. Satan is. The devil is. See, if we can look past that person and see the evil spirit that's, that's enforcing that, that is encouraging them to say that, that's driving them, then we'll know, hey, then we'll give them some grace. Because, see, you may not know what they went through that day, what they were dealt with, and then it just took something, the devil just to whisper a little thought in their ear, and then they went off on you. You know, when all the time they wouldn't have done it in a normal day, if they hadn't been under stress and pressure, they would have never done it. That's why you have to have, have to walk in forgiveness, you know, and we have to give grace to people. You know, see the words, and then the word says that we're to pull down strongholds in our minds. See, you ever think about a stronghold? All a stronghold in your mind is that the devil gives you a thought and you dwell on it and it becomes a stronghold, you know. You, if you just think, how many, how many thoughts do you think you go through you have in a day, in one day? I mean, it could be, it could be a thousand. I mean, there's const thoughts constantly flowing through your head. You know, I mean, it can be from this world that you're living in. They can be from your own personal self. can be from God the Father. Or they can be from the enemy. See, and they're all coming through. But the thing of it is, you have to judge them by the Word of God. Before you, let me get to this right here. See, look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. But see, if the thoughts of thoughts that we have, if they don't line up with the Word of God, we don't speak them out of our mouth. See, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the thing of it is, see, the first thing you've do, got to do is get your flesh under control. Because, see, that's one of the avenues the devil can come against you through your flesh. You know, but then if you renew your mind, you renew your mind, then you start to think like God thinks. Remember Isaiah 55, 11 says that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But guess what? When you renew your mind, you think just like he does. You know, you start thinking like God thinks. And you start judging things like God judges them. That's why you can tell the difference when he comes against you. When that thought comes you say, God's not of God. You cast that thing down. You say, well, how do you cast it down? You know, Brother Hagin said, I just laugh them off. But see, sometimes we don't, we, we're not in that place where we can do that. So you have to say something out of your mouth that negates that thought. See, and another thing, you know, uh, the devil doesn't know if we believe his lie, his thought, unless we speak it out of our mouth. See, that's the thing a lot of people don't realize. You know, they don't realize if, if you, a thought comes and you don't speak it, it dies unborn. But if once it comes out of your mouth, guess what? You own it. We own it. You know, if he gives me a lie and I buy it into it and he says, Sheila, Sheila did that on purpose. You know, 
And, and then you buy into that lie. You say, why did you do that to me? And you get mad. See, then you have just bought into his lie, and now you cause friction in the house. See, so that's, he, see he's a manipulator. He, he, he manipulates us. That's his way of, that's his motive. That's the way he does you. You know, he, if he can't get you any other way, he'll come, he'll come against your mind and try to manipulate you into doing something you shouldn't against somebody else. See, Matthew 6, 31a says this. It says, therefore, take no thought saying. See, if you, just t- if you just took that little piece of scripture right there, take no thought saying. In other words, you don't take that thought unless you say it out of your mouth, good or bad. But once you say it out of your mouth, like I said, you own it. You know, Brother Hagen once said, he said it like this. They said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. So in other words, he was talking about thoughts when he said that. He said, thoughts are going to come. But guess what? You don't have to accept that thought. You don't have to receive that thought as your own. Like I said, you don't say it. You don't act on it. And that thought will die unborn. It's just like, uh, let me say this one thought. And uh, I hopefully I won't offend anybody, but I want to say this one thought. The devil has fed the church a lie in this aspect right here. He, he, he it would come around. He'll give us a thought. You know, a dirty thought, bad thought, whatever, angry thought, whatever. He'll give you a thought. And then in a second later, he'll come back and says, well, you can't be right with God. You can't be a Christian. You wouldn't have thought like that. Right. See, and see, he, I mean, he, he's, you know, he knows how to manipulate people. You know, he's a deceiver, and he knows how to manipulate people. But if you get in this word, and you let this word be your, your standard for everything, you judge every thought that comes, every th- situation, everything by this word, then he can't do you that way. Then you say, oh, it's stupid, devil. I don't, I don't buy into that. You know, he says, you'll never make it. You'll never be anything. You, you, if you let you come out of your mouth, I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. I can do all things through Christ. You, you talk back to that thought with the word of God. And when you do, like, it's, like they said with Jesus, he leaves you for a season. He'll try that a few times, and you, you have the right words. You say the word of God. He'll get tired of that. He'll leave. He'll say, oh, let's go find somebody else. You know, I'm not saying he won't come back because he will. He t- said he left Jesus for a season. He'll come back. But guess what? If you're staying in the Word every day, you're just as built up then as you were then. So he has to, all he can do is run away again. You know, flee. You know, I give you a challenge. You know, I like to challenge people. You know, read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 19. It talks about the armor of God. You know, it talks about the helmet of salvation. That helmet is to protect your mind, your thought process. You know, and then you've got the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? It says it stops the fiery darts. What do you think the fiery darts are? They're thoughts. They're thoughts coming against you from the evil one. See, because he cannot do anything to you. He cannot control you unless you receive his thoughts, unless you buy into his thoughts. Satan sees himself as a puppet master. Yep, he sees himself as a puppet master. You know, and you think about a puppet master. You know, when I think of puppet master... In fact, uh, there was a rock and roll song years ago about Satan, the puppet master. But anyway, uh, but you think about, th- I, th- I think about that, I think of Pinocchio. Remember Pinocchio, the little cartoon? I mean, here you got Pinocchio. He's a little wooden puppet, you know, and he's got all these strings, you know. And the, and the puppet master, you know, he's he making him walk and move his arms and doing all this, all this funny stuff. But see, the Satan, he sees himself that way. He sees himself as the master puppet, puppeteer. He sees himself manipulating people. And uh, he, he's already got the world, so he can manipulate them any way he wants to. He pulls their strings all day long because they're not saved. They're, they're in the same nature he is, so he, they're, they have no choice. But when it comes to the Christian, he would rather come after us because we've got God in us. And he hates God, therefore he hates you and me. So if he can manipulate us, pull our strings, you know, like I said before, he studies you. So he knows what makes you mad, makes you upset, makes you angry. And, if he, and he'll use those things, angry, strife. You know, he used thoughts and words to affect our emotions. You know, the trouble with most people, well, all people really, we're affected by our emotions. You know, and if he can get you emotionally upset, he can pretty much manipulate you, get you to do anything he wants. He can get you to argue, he can get you to fuss, he can get you to fight. You know, all because a lot of times, when pe- especially when people are tired or weak, I've seen times when I've worked for... At Vanderbilt, we'd have a snowstorm. I'd be there for three, three days at a straight before I got to come home and rest. And you'd come home, and you know what? You were tired. You were irritated. 
And all Sheila or John have to do is have something out of place. And off I go. Because what? I was at a weak place. I was at a place where it's easy for the evil one, the devil, to manipulate me. To, to stir me up and get me to say or do something I shouldn't. But so see, we can't let him do that. He has a, as a, even a puppet master. Even Satan, he has no power over us. See, you know, our most powerful weapons are God's word coming out of our mouth and used in the name of Jesus. You know, we saw in Matthew 4 where Jesus used the word of God, you know, on, this, on Satan, the devil, and he told him, you know, he said, it is written. See, we need, that's, why, that's a big part of why we meditate on these scriptures so that when the evil one comes and he gives you this evil thought or he, he brings something against you, um, you know, somebody that's, that you love, that is close to you, they come and say something to you, you know, first thing you want to do is take offense or take hurt. But then if, you're, if you've got the word of God, you let the word of God come out of your mouth and say, no, they love me. They did not mean to do that. Lord, I forgive them. See, you let the forgiveness, you let words of kindness come out of your mouth instead of anger or hate or, or destructive words. See, how do we enjoy the victory God has already given to us? Let me give you a challenge. Get in the word of God. Go from the, the letters to the church, starting in Romans. Read through the letters to the church. Find everywhere in there where it says, in him, in Christ, in whom, through whom. Find out what those are. Highlight them. Mark them. Read them. Because that will tell you who you are in Christ, how the authority you have in Christ, and, how, you know, and the power and authority you have to deal with the enemy. See, the Bible says that we have all authority in heaven and earth. Let's look at um, Matthew 28, 18, and we'll get ready to close this thing. And Jesus came and spake unto them and saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Okay, and so see, he, what, he, what did he say there? He said, he said, All power and authority in heaven and in earth is given to me. Now, he didn't relegate that authority to us. In the fact that he didn't give it up, he still got that power, even though he seated at the right hand of the Father. But he delegated it to us, to you and me. He said, "In my name," you know. And he see, he he need to understand that all that power and authority has already been given to us through the finished work of Jesus. Go ye therefore is a legal term. It's like a mayor would would uh, evoke a, a, a command or charge over a new police officer. You know, he would, he would give him the authority for that city to, to uphold the law. And anything that police officer did in, the day, in a part of his duty, his job, the mayor and the government of that city would back it up. Well, guess what? You and I have got something more, more powerful than the city. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven backing up us when we stand up and take our rightful place. See, you know, like I said before, it's like swearing in a police officer or a delegated representative. You know, say, Bible says we're ambassadors for Christ. So if you're an ambassador, then you have the authority to speak, to act, and to operate for the kingdom that you come from. We're from the kingdom of heaven. This earth is not our kingdom. We're from the kingdom of heaven, and we have authority from heaven to take charge down here. While we're here, we're to take charge. An ambassador doesn't lack for anything. You go around and say, oh, man, I'm, just, I'm just, a, just an old Christian. I'm just scratching by, but I'm living for Jesus. No, honey, that's not the way you're supposed to be. Ambassador is supposed to have plenty. Ambassador is supposed to be, have, he's supposed to be to make a show. I mean, God, Jesus likes to show us out. He likes to show off, and he likes to use his children to do it with. But you know what? We're always thinking, well, you know, the devil's fed us this lie. Oh, well, I'll never be nothing. You know, who would, who would believe anything I'd say? Well, see, you just bought into that lie. You need to cast that thing down and say, no, no. I am a child of God. I am an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have his total authority to walk out here and stop this traffic, do whatever I have to do in the name of Jesus, and it has to obey me. Satan, you see Satan coming against somebody, and, you, and you've got the position, and they will allow you. You go down, you buy that thing. You say, in the name of Jesus, I, you cease and desist right now in the name of Jesus, and they have no choice. Because we are in, we're in a spiritual realm. We're, we have power and authority in the spiritual realm, the faith realm. See, the trouble, people, they try to say faith is a bad word. No, honey, faith is what will put you over because you take that faith in the word of God and you speak it forth with power and authority. And guess what? All of heaven gets behind that and it comes to pass. 
What did Matthew 18, 18? He said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on in heaven or loose on earth is loosed in heaven. In other words, he said, you, may, you do the binding, you do the loosing, and I'll back it up. Amen. See, it goes right back to this thing where he's delegated that authority to us. You know, and I just want to thank you. I'm two minutes over. But I, wanna, I just want to thank you for this opportunity, and I asked you all to come up and look forward to next week when Gary speaks. And, Pastor, again, thank you. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for this the congregation. I thank you for the people that came out tonight, Lord. I ask you to bless them. I pray they got something out of this, Lord, that will change their life, will encourage them, bring them to a higher place with you. And, Father, go with us as we go this week. Bring us back Sunday full of hope, joy, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank <laughs> you.